have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Acts chapter 9. We're going to continue uh, in our walk through Acts. This is really a powerful point here in, in, in the book of Acts. Um, we're going to see the conversion of a man named Saul. Now, we're all familiar with the Apostle Paul. Um, Paul did not have a name change. Like, it's not like his name changed once he came to Christ. Paul is his Roman name. He was a Roman citizen. Uh, it was very common for Roman citizens to have three names. They would have a first name. They would have a, a middle name, which would be Paul. And they would have a family name as well. We don't know Paul's other Roman names. We only know his Roman name is Paul. But we know that his Hebrew name is Saul. Often, Jewish parents would pick a Roman name that was similar or sounds similar to their Hebrew name. So Paul doesn't have a name change, but he does have a conversion. And this conversion is pretty significant. I want you, I want you to think about the Apostle Paul, right? We, we, we talked about him, that he was, it's very possible that he was present during the trials of Jesus, Right, as Jesus is brought into the Sanhedrin, it's very possible that Paul was there. The Bible doesn't tell us, but we know that Gamaliel is Paul's teacher. And Gamaliel has a very prominent position in the Sanhedrin to the point the man gets a very special title even in Jewish writings. They talk about this man as a highly respected teacher of teachers. And this was Paul's instructor. So very probable that Paul was at the trials of Jesus. It's very probable that Paul was at the trials of the apostles as well, as they were brought before the Sanhedrins. We know that Paul was present for Stephen's death. Not only was he present, but what did he do? He gave approval, okay, as he stood with the coats so that the men could really swing those stones. So we know that Paul is definitely present with some of the uh, persecution going against the church. But we see that he has, a, he has an incredible zeal, an absolute passion for God, though it's misguided, misdirected, an overwhelming passion because why? He makes it his personal desire to stamp out this new faith called the way. He wants to eliminate it. And he takes a personal a personal vendetta against it. And we see him ravage the church. We see it continue to cause issues and problems and to, um, to cause many Christians to begin leaving and dispersing out. Well, we see here in Acts chapter 9, Paul wants to chase down those people too. He's not wanting to, to institute persecution only in Jerusalem. He actually wants to hunt these people down and drag them back. But he needs jurisdictional power to do that. So he goes to the religious magistrate and say, Hey, would you give me letters that I can go all the way to Damascus, 135 miles north of Jerusalem, and drag these people back, men and women? And the high priests... And the chief priests gladly give their consent. Okay. But Paul, on his journey, he's going to have a conversion experience. A literal conversion experience. And this is different than just somebody, you know, something kind of... He wasn't just stirred emotionally. A literal conversion took place. This man is not the same man after this moment he meets Jesus. He's different. He's changed, but we're going to see some of that residual bit of his flesh nature and pharisaical training remains in him. How many of us know that it's very difficult to change our ways of thinking? <laughs> it's very difficult to change our ways of thinking, especially, just to give you an idea about Paul, Paul would have started learning the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, at age five. The training would have begun to start learning what Torah says. By the time he gets to 13 and has his... Um, his official ceremony moving in uh, from boy to manhood, he would have likely been sent to Jerusalem to get strong training, intentional training in traditions and the Talmud and all of it. This is where he likely would have ended up with Gamaliel. And to end up with this guy, right, the top of all the teachers, it means Paul had 
he had some abilities. God had gifted him greatly intellectually. At 13, to go, go sit with the, the best of, of, of all the rabbis in the land, one of the best that has existed according to Jewish writings, uh, you, you had to be somebody pretty sharp. And Paul goes, and he gets to now start that training at 13. Paul's now a man. We don't know how old Paul is when he has this conversion, but I'm just trying to set the context here. All of Paul's theology is about to change. Everything he's believed since a boy, everything he was trained in, everything he was taught, all the traditions that was pounded into him, it's all about to change. When we talk about a conversion, this is what conversion begins to look like. This is what conversion, when you come to Jesus, you're not just a little better version of yourself. You're an entirely new creature, an entirely new creation. Amen. This is what the Bible is encouraging us to take up. Now, keep this in context, right? Paul, for those of you that were at the Roman study, remember back on this. Paul is writing about 30 years after his conversion, the letter to the church in Rome. And the church in Rome, there was a great division that took place in them. The emperor Claudius expelled all the Jews from Rome. At some point, they were allowed to come back. But all the Gentile Christians had taken over the church. So now when the Jewish, when the Jewish believers came back, there was a division, an issue, and a problem. They argued over, guess what? Preferences. They argued over what is the right way to do this. Paul who has been trained since a little boy, trained intensely from 13 years old forward, trained, not only trained hard, but he lived it out hard what he believed, is now writing to this church and saying, guys, straighten up. I am one who understands having to completely change my theological construct of God. I was once the chief persecutor of the church. In fact, so zealous was I, I was outdoing my peers in my zeal, not only for the traditions and not only for the law, but also in my ability to persecute. I was outdoing everybody. I was driven, man. I was driven hard. And Paul is writing to them, encouraging them, maintain a unity. Maintain the love because your identity is not circumcision or uncircumcision. Your identity is whom? Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. That, Paul, when I talk about this conversion taking place, he is literally not the same person anymore. It is a radical transformation. His entire theological construct of who he thinks God is, how he thinks God operates, and everything that he thinks synagogue and faith and religion ought to be is about to get wrecked. I don't know about you, but that would feel pretty uncomfortable. That would be hard to try and walk through something like that. Because listen, it's not just, oh, I believe something one way all my life. I literally lived it out one way all my life. And now I'm being confronted with truth. And let's read what happens with Paul. This takes place about 34 AD. The church births about 30, 31. So Paul has been an effective persecutor of the church for about three, maybe four years. This boy is getting it. Now he's going to seek letters from the, from the high priest to go and run these people down outside of Jerusalem as well. Verse 1, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder. What is this saying? He's literally not only carrying out physical acts, he's speaking many hateful things, many divisive things, many hard things. Still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest's, and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that, so that he found any, who, any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he wants these letters to go to Damascus. I've already mentioned it's 135 miles roughly north-northeast of Jerusalem. 
It takes about six days to walk there. You're doing about 22 and a half miles a day. One, you just got to say, man, them boys are in shape too. 22 and a half miles on a non-paved road. Now, Rome had really good roads, don't get me wrong, but still, 22 and a half miles a day and keeping that pace for six days, you're getting it. Now, of course, they could have done it faster if they had horses. We don't know if Paul's riding on horses or riding on a donkey. But we do see that he's on his way to Damascus from Jerusalem. Verse 3. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. This light is to indicate God's Shekinah glory, that same glory that was, that, that was once inside the temple. It's that same glory. Think about when Jesus transfigured in front of Peter, James, and John. His light shone, uh, I'm sorry, his face shone with great light, and his clothes, they, they, they became bright. And then as Peter, of course, was saying, well, you know, the Lord is good that we're here. Should we make you a tent? One for you and Moses and Elijah. Then a bright cloud comes and comes over the top of Peter. God's presence shows up often in a very strong, strong light. So this literal glory of God shows up from heaven and it shone and it shines all around Paul. Verse four, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? With this voice saying his name twice, it's, it's an endearment. There's an affection that's there. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Verse 5, and he said, who are you, Lord? This isn't just who are you, sir. Paul has enough awareness that what's happening is supernatural. This man has studied his scriptures, right? He would have known God's light show, has shown up like this in multiple places. He would have known that God has shown up to people in the past. He's shown up to Moses. He showed up to Gideon. Just go right on down the list. And he recognizes something, that this is something that's clearly supernatural that's taking place. Look at the second part here of verse 5. And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. I want to highlight something what Jesus is doing here. Right? He calls out to Saul, 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 and this affectionate, this affectionate call to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? How is Paul persecuting Jesus? Is Jesus actually there? Is he running down Jesus and trying to persecute him? What's that? He's killing his followers. So what is Jesus doing? He's identifying himself with his followers. I just want you to think about what that means for you and what that means for me. Elsewhere in the scripture, the Bible calls um, God's people the apple of his eye, right? The apple of the eye is, is the, the uh, pupil. So what God is saying is like, hey, basically when somebody's messing with you, it's like poking me straight in the eye. How, how long... How long do you have to get poked in the eye until you, like, it has your full attention? You ever have, like, a kid who's trying to get your attention and they accidentally poke you in the eye? Like, man, they have your undivided attention now? Yeah, it only takes once to get poked in the eye until it gets your attention. This is what God is identifying him, his, his followers with. Here Jesus is saying to Saul, you are literally persecuting me. I, I, my followers are an extension of who I am. They're an extension of me. We can take great solace and great joy in this. That we are not alone in our difficulties, our trials, our persecution. This is why, beloved, I've, I've, I've encouraged us that in our professions or in our families or in whatever circumstances with our friends, don't shy away from moments of difficulty or persecution now, I'm definitely not saying don't run for them, like try to create these moments of conflict. But I'm also saying, encouraging us, don't run from them. Give God the opportunity to glorify himself through you. We love the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We love the faith of Daniel. And we go, man, that's great. 
we say that's great because they didn't go looking for the problem, but when the problem came, they didn't go hiding either. They didn't try to just quickly smooth and settle everything down. They stepped into it saying, well, God, you're going to have to do something. I'm not going to change the convictions of who I am and following after you. You're going to, you're going to have to act, God. You're going to have to do something. And we commend them for their great faith. When we go through difficulties in our workspace, with families, with friends, and we're being attacked for our Christian faith, you understand they're attacking Christ in you. Let Christ defend himself. That might be words that he'll give you to say. That might be something he'll put on your heart to do. But look, look for him in those moments. Here Jesus is identifying, he's telling Paul, Paul, you listen, when you persecute them, you're persecuting me. Verse 7, the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. So Paul is fasting here as a sign or an expression of mourning or repentance. He just encountered the risen Jesus. I want you just to think about it from Paul's perspective for a minute, right? You're literally breathing out threats of murder and destruction to all the people who belong to the way that follow after this Jesus. This Jesus now shows up, reveals himself to you in a powerful way. It drops you to the ground. And you hear not a voice of condemnation. You hear a voice of compassion. God is literally showing, though, Paul, you are my enemy, I love you, and I'm here to save you. Think about how this is going to shake Paul. And as he's confronted with this, going like, no, 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 hold, hold, hold on. Like, I heard Gamaliel say back, back to the Sanhedrin, that if this whole movement these apostles are all doing and all these guys are doing, if this movement is from God, we dare not oppose it lest we be directly opposing God. Paul was very likely there listening to his teacher instruct all the Sanhedrin on this. And now Paul is going, wait a minute. I am found in my religious zeal to be directly opposing the Most High God? This would have shaken Paul to the core absolutely shaking him to the core. How am I, who is zealous, and, and, and I've been following you since my youth. I've been in pursuit of you with great vigor. How am I found opposing you? And yet, though I was found your enemy, you did not come to me in condemnation. You came to me with your love. For what purpose? To offer me salvation. To save me from myself. I think the only proper response for Paul is to fast for a few days. This would have been a radical transformation for this man. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at, the house, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has, seen, he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hand on him so that he might regain his sight. So here we've got this man who is called the disciple of the Lord. Who Jesus comes and speaks to him and says, listen, here's what's going on. I've got this guy named, named Saul. He's at Judas' house. He's at the end of the street. So Ananias might be on the other end of that street. Um, Damascus, after it was um, later conquered, they changed the way that their street grid worked. And they went to more of a you know, straight line grid, the way that a lot of our, our cities kind of follow. That's a, that's, that's a Greek way of doing, of setting up streets. 
So Damascus' streets are now changed. Scholars think that straight, straight street was likely the main drag, so it's straight up the middle. The point here that I want to highlight, though, is that notice, notice God's full awareness of every detail of this. He knows what he's about to do with Saul. He knows the disciple he's going to use to go and pray for him. He says, literally, while I'm telling you to do this, I'm actually telling Paul in a vision that you, by name, are coming to him to pray for him so that he might regain his sight. So now you need to go do. You understand, we have assigned appointments like that as well. We get assigned opportunities like that as well. We have the opportunity to share this love with other people, the love of God, that you're not, you you do not need to remain an enemy of his anymore, that while I was an enemy, Christ died for me because he loves me, and now I have received what he has given, and he's making me into an entirely new person. He's changing me, right? We get the opportunity to share with, with the lost that not only does God love you, but he forgives you. What a message of freedom, is it not? To be forgiven of our guilt, our shame, our sins, the baggage we carry, all the things that we don't feel like we deserve forgiveness or the junk that we carry and go, well, I did, I've done all these things, so that's just what I am. God is forgiving and freeing people from all of that. He says, look, your identity is not found in your faults. Your identity is found only in In me, says Jesus, only in me. Get your eyes off yourself. Well, Lord, I I struggle with this or I struggle with that. I understand. Keep giving it to me. Keep your eyes fixed on me. What a God that's pursuing and going, running after people, even an enemy like Saul. Even an enemy like Saul, he went after. So what does that tell us for our enemies? What about that person that you just can't stand and you hate? What about that person or persons, plural? God is showing us his heart towards his enemies. So we too are to adopt that same heart. And it's hard, is it not? Yet God says, I will do the work in you. I will not ask of you something that I'm incapable of doing in you. But Ananias, he starts to rebuttal with the Lord, like, uh, hold on a minute, Lord. Jesus gives him instructions, tells him exactly where Paul is, what he is doing, where he is praying, what vision he is receiving in the prayer to go and do this. But Ananias answers, Lord, um, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. That's a fair that's a fair response back to the Lord. But the Lord said to him, "Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine." A chosen instrument. What is he saying? He's one of quality. He's a fine instrument. And he's a fine instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, notice what he refers to Saul as. Brother. Ananias believed the testimony of the Lord that Paul is converted. <laughs> Brother Saul, apparently, <laughs> apparently we're brothers. Please don't kill me. But apparently we're brothers. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me to you that you may regain your sight and what? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking, and taking food, he was strengthened. 
who was once an enemy of God is now a chosen instrument of his, a, fi a fine quality. Do you know that that's literally the same description God puts on each of you? Yes. We were once all enemies, and now you are his chosen instrument of fine quality. That's your identity. That's how he views you. That's how he sees you. A chosen instrument of fine quality for what purpose? To carry his name. God is not ashamed to put his name upon you. He's not ashamed to make you known before the throne and all of heaven that, he, that you're one of his. Even in your faults, your failures, your habitual sin, he's not ashamed of you to put his name upon you. What a God we have. And this purpose that he does this is so that it will hopefully invoke a literal conversion inside of us to where we say, you know what? I actually don't want to be the same person I've always been. I don't want my old identity. I want this new one, Christ, that you have to offer. It doesn't make any sense that you would offer it. But I want to receive it. Make me a new creation. And here is Paul go echoing back to Romans, as I mentioned before. He's writing to that divided church, saying to them, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, which is your acceptable worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind in order that you can then discern what is the good, acceptable, and pleasing will of God. Think about that statement now that we've read about his conversion. Thirty years later from this point, he writes that. Someone who literally had to go through that. To say all that religion that I believed in, all that tradition that I held fast to, I found it was empty. In fact, I found it was actually opposing, opposing the Most High God. So now I'm in this work that I'm having to have my mind transformed and renewed. Paul writes to the Galatians that he says, and when, he, when he talks about this point, and we're going to see, what, next week we'll catch up here in, in Acts chapter 9, and we're going to see, Paul has to go to Arabia for three years to have his mind changed to be taught by the Lord. Unlearn what he learned and taught with the truth. But he retained that prior knowledge for what purpose? That he can go, just like Jesus says here, so that he can go to the children of Israel and help bring them out of darkness as well. But then also notice this. In verse 16, he says that, I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And we know Paul goes through that immensely. He is beaten multiple times. He is stoned. He is shipwrecked a couple times. I mean, he's like, hey, I'm burying. Listen to what he says. That his body is taking the licks, the beating, that are lacking in Jesus. He's not saying Jesus is lacking anything. He's being, he recognizes that he is identified with Jesus because that's how Jesus identifies him. Does that make sense? The beatings that they're giving to me, it's as though they're beating Jesus. It's not about me anymore, says Paul. It's not about me anymore. But then we get this man, this disciple, who goes on and lays hands. This is, this is a mention of somebody who's not an apostle going to lay hands on somebody and fill them with the Spirit. There is dogma out there that teaches, no, all of that stuff stopped with the apostles and only the apostles did it. Well, you got a problem. Ananias is doing it, and he's not numbered among the apostles. God is still active in changing lives. We are the ones that hinder that process. So, beloved, what I encourage us, what I encourage us is that we do not hinder him anymore, but that we allow him to truly convert us into the image that he desires us to be in. And who is that image? It's the image of Jesus. 
don't know about you, but that seems really impossible for God to do that in me. I do not reflect Jesus very well at all. But yet God says, I'm faithful to complete in you what I've began. My and your only response is yes and amen. Amen.